Uh, well, Zach, I'm I'm, uh, I'm happy to finally meet you. Uh, 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 you bring such interesting um, new ideas to the sport of baseball, uh, a sport that uh, is pretty traditional, and um, and in my opinion, in need of new ideas. Um, and it's so cool. This is my second podcast of the day. Earlier, I had a kind of a basketball tennis guru, Lee Taft. And, and now we have a, a baseball guru um, in the track football consortium. And the whole idea here is that, and you addressed it so well with your talk about silos, is that uh, football coaches hang out with football coaches and they probably need some cross-pollination happening. And Absolutely. track coaches are the same way. You know, there's so many track coaches that bitch about the football coach hoarding his athletes and not letting them run track. And I'm like, I wouldn't let my guys run track with you either the way you coach it. You know, so maybe we yeah. need to start getting together and talking. And and I just think that uh, uh, having you on is, is, is a fantastic thing. The first thing uh, I'd like to ask is describe your athletic career. So I uh, I... <laughs> Grew up in a town with 300 people. I played six man and eight man football, if you can believe that. So, uh, in what state? In Kansas, Ransom, okay. Kansas, which was actually the home of a uh, famous, I think he's in the Hall of Fame, a famous uh, safety by the name of Nolan Cromwell. He was a starting sure. quarterback yeah. at Kansas, ended up being up for the Heisman Trophy, was just missed out on the Olympics. Um, but anyway, our hometown has 300 people in it. Um, so, we'd get enough guys hurt on the football team, we'd have to go down and play six man football. Um, but <laughs> Alongside with that, I always was a football player, but you played every sport in a small town. So I was a four-sport athlete, basketball, um, track and field, obviously, uh, baseball, five-sport, I should say, baseball, um, no, four-sport, there we go, football, <laughs> track, yeah, basketball, and baseball, there we go, four-sport. Um, so you played everything, right? And from there, I went to junior college at Garden City Community College as a football, a football athlete. I played tailback there and then transferred to uh, Missouri State where uh, I was a running back there for two years after that, uh, got into uh, strength and conditioning by way of University of Washington, by way of uh, back at Missouri State, and then went to the Anaheim Angels for two years. Wow. So, so you were with the, with the Anaheim Angels and before you were at T TCU? Yes. Yeah, so I went Anaheim Angels two years there. I went to Wyoming for about a six-month six stint uh, with football, and then um, – TCU was a very fortunate opportunity because they wanted somebody that was football based for strength and conditioning, but the baseball staff wanted somebody that had been in professional baseball and knew the game of baseball. There's not that many of them out there, to be honest, that have been in professional baseball yet have a, a football background as extensive as I did. And so I was the perfect fit for kind of both staffs. And um, yeah, it, it, it really just, it was the perfect situation at the right time. And it worked out for the best. And what you were talking on earlier, the reason that I am an outlier in baseball is because I came from a football background. Um, everything I'd studied up to that point, really, there was a ton of it in Soviet literature, in track and field, in, you know, Charlie Francis and speed development. And so I came with all of these different ideas on just how to develop athletes. And I, I applied it to baseball. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. Baseball was built around speed and power in, in all phases. And that's not what baseball believes in the training, though. That's <laughs> never what they've believed in, which is so odd, right? Yes. So I'm an outlier because I wanted to train guys to be big, fast, strong, and powerful. And right. I brought all the, the training that you would utilize in track and, and football and any other, uh, any other avenue that would develop an athlete. I brought that to baseball, and I was looked at as an outlier. Sure. And, and it is so counterintuitive. Um, and, and you make a, a, a great presentation of baseball is one energy system. One, I mean, there is people are never blurred vision from acidosis in a baseball game ever, I, ever. And, and they are never cross country athletes ever. So, right. so there's only one type of training that that makes any sense at all but yet that training was never done probably because of the world war ii effect on sports in america where where even golf coaches tried to make it hard tried to turn boys into men try to have that bonding experience through torture and all that kind of stuff 
So my question to you, and th th this is probably going to hit you from uh, 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 as, as a weird question, but if if you were hired as an SNC coach for soccer, would your fundamental uh, uh, priorities change? Uh, to be honest, no. I, we have this talk all the time because I, you know, I, I run the internship program here, and one of, and soccer is one of our one of the sports that we dive the deepest into with needs analysis, energy system development, and so what you learn when you truly watch. This is my favorite quote from Charlie Francis: "Francis, watch the athlete, not the sport." And so many people get caught up in watching the sport, which if you watch it from from a you know a large scale view, what do you see? You see people running everywhere. The ball's here. The ball's there. And so we take it as, man, it's just, you just continually run. If you really watch the athlete, it's a lactic bursts with some aerobic, aerobic recoveries in there, right? It really never borders that much on the uh, anaerobic glycolytic energy system or, or the lactic energy system, whatever you want to call it, whatever the people think it is. It never really borders on that because it's a lactic short, intense bursts with long recoveries in between often, right? And the higher the level of the soccer athlete, the less, the less energy system development in that anaerobic glycolytic and aerobic you really even need because they understand the game so well, they can conserve energy and have very short, intense bursts when they need it and then, and then restore essentially and recover during those times when they don't need it because they understand the play, the technical tactical aspects of the game. The lower level athletes actually use way more energy because they don't understand the in intricate details of if a ball is over there, I don't need to cover all this ground to go somewhere, understand technically and tactically where I have to be to be the most efficient with my energy conservation. You don't get that with the younger athletes. But no, in, in short, uh, it really wouldn't change all that much. It would still be built around speed, power. And then, yes, maybe we need to build the aerobic energy system with, with uh, recovery efforts and things like that to get parasympathetic, to help our athletes recover and build in some of that volume on feet that they're going to have. But outside of that, it, 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 the, the fundamentals all stay the same. Yes, I love that answer. I, I, was, I know nothing about soccer. I, I don't like to watch it or anything. But I was, I was on a, a soccer podcast with two S&C guys that were really good from, uh, from UMass. And they asked me about it. And I asked them a question back. What are the, the best soccer players? Describe them. And they just looked at each other and said, they're fast. They're powerful. They, they, yeah, they're, pa that's it. That's yeah. what they are. And, and, and then they said back to me, but in soccer, a college soccer athlete has to run nine miles. I said, yeah, but what, what amount of that is at anything more than a walk or a jog? They right. said, not very much. And so, so my point to those people who always want to, to try to reproduce the game and training is that do we really need to train to walk and jog? No, we need to train those high right. outputs. Right, exactly. And so I, I just love your answer on that. And I, I kind of knew what you would say. It's, and it's the interesting thing is it's those high outputs once or twice a game that are the difference makers, right? <gasps> The it's winners. not the walking and jogging. It's the one, it's the one breakaway play with, uh, at, seven, at the 78th minute that you got to step on somebody else and score a goal because you have a higher output than the other person. That's the difference makers. Absolutely. And I, I think one of my sayings uh, is kind of controversial, but I say, let the game be the hardest thing you do because the absolute best specificity for the game is the game. And somebody says, well, we have to be in shape for the first game. I said, do you? Like, do you really, the first game, is that the important game? And it's really not. It, it's, you, you, if you'll train speed and power, then you get to gradually get into better game shape without losing that speed and power, which leads me to one of my favorite things in your presentations, the Matt Ray stuff. Um, I think, I think coaches have always known there's things that improve you and things that are a waste of time. What they don't realize is that there's things that detrain you. So tell, restate your stuff about the Matt Ray baseball study. Yeah, so I think you're talking about the uh, where they tested power. They wanted yes. to determine power over the course of the season. And they had a group that did speed and speed endurance and a group that did basically high-intensity endurance training. 
And the group that, what I would say, wasted energy with long duration, high intensity endurance training. And the parameters for that, I think they said 45 to 60 minutes was how long that group would train, three to two to three times per week. So essentially you're looking at long distance runs, poles, things like that. Um, the group that did those long distance things, their power suffered throughout the course of the season. It actually went down when, you, when, when they looked at a med ball throw or a vertical jump. I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was a vertical jump, uh, if, if memory serves me right. The group that did speed and speed endurance, their power actually went up. So it talks about that we need to understand that our training complements each other. We need to put the, uh, the, the uh, speed and power, those things complement each other. And we're going to get, we're going to raise the outputs on honestly, both of those, if we're working through those things through the entire course of the season, whereas something that is very non-complementary, and this is where the, con, uh, the, uh, the uh, concurrent system came from was aerobic training on one end, high output, a lactic training on the other. And oftentimes you saw, you didn't see gains that you would normally see if you did one or the other, which you saw during their study as well. When you did too much long distance endurance training, it, it, it fills the cup up, you're, you're wasting too much energy and power adaptation goes down. And we know baseball is an alactic dominant sport where we want speed and power to be at its peak, you know, throughout the entire course of the season. And if we're doing something that takes away from that, then we're not serving our athletes right. And it's not only in performance, but you also make the point that, that when you don't practice high outputs, high outputs will hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the Isserin study I talk about for us, our principles when it comes to speed development are fast, frequent and fresh. And I think honestly, you, you talk about that. They might, they might be, might even be your words. I don't know, but we have to have frequency in there because if you don't stimulate maximal velocity on a weekly basis, in our opinion, then you are risking your health. You're risking a hamstring injury in the future. And the chart that I show of Isserin talks uh, about we lose the, the, the biochemical effects, the neuromuscular effects, usually in about a five-day window, plus or minus three days. So you're looking at two to eight days. So we just say every week, let's stimulate maximal velocity every week. How do we do that with our athletes in season? We do it in the warm-up. But I'm also lucky. I have a GPS system. So I can see who's stimulated max velocity throughout their gameplay or whatever it is during the week. If they don't, we can always go back and touch up on, on max V with the kid that has it. But in the off season, we hit it every single week because where coaches fail is you take it away for three or four weeks because you're doing a fall season or whatever it is. Guess what? You really need to build back into that safely with your athletes or you're again, you're risking a hamstring injury to take your, in my opinion, and this could be different. You get, you could have a different opinion, but with my, my uh, team sport athletes, we need a little bit of a ramp in to get back up to speed when it comes to max velocity. And if you take it away for four weeks, I'm not going to jump back into it with max fly sprints because I've seen, I've seen our kids get hurt doing it. So we usually use a two or three week ramp in. So now I've wasted two or three weeks that I could have been developing it had I just maintained a touch yes. of it that window that we didn't do it. And I, I think that, um, that my ideas, we, we sprint on day one. We, we don't have a ramp in. Yeah, and but, that's, that's something I actually want to talk to you about sometimes. So maybe we touch on it here. We, we can talk on now. I, I, do, I wonder, and I don't know this for sure, I wonder if working with 15, 16, and 17 year olds, they are a little more robust uh, and resilient. To yeah, you, you know, it, it, maybe we have never had a day one sprint injury. And we have, I have done this for 22 years. We're without a ramp in, without a warm up. We, yeah, we warm up, we do high intent speed drills and exercises, and then we sprint. But we've never had an injury on day one. And, but I wonder, like, for example, my kids, um, I know some college kids, uh, they lift for eight straight weeks before yeah. they, before they go to, that, that's what they think working out is. And, and they lift where there's mirrors on the wall yeah. and they, they lift next to people who have veins popping out of their arms, um, who are, you know, maybe roided up or whatever. And whenever I see a kid like that, who kind of 
is a clunker, you know, walking into a speed workout, yeah. I'm thinking right away, that, that guy, that guy is an injury waiting to happen. So if I was dealing with hairy legged college kids, maybe they need a ramp in. So, yeah. so maybe, maybe we're talking the same thing here. So, you know, wh one thought I had with your athletes too, is that when you guys start your track workouts and your, your, your flies and stuff day one, is that in the spring where they've kind of been at school and participating in other, in other sports and all this stuff during that time? And so maybe it's because they've already been running. They've already been sprinting in other sports and, and moving around. Whereas with us, August you know, 15th or whatever, when school starts that first day, our kids have been in summer ball, but they've also been off for the previous three weeks or so before they ever get back on campus. And you tell them, hey, I need you doing this. I need you, you know, I need you doing your buildups and your speed work to be to so that we can jump into a day one. But we all know what happens with a lot of these guys when they go home. It's it's, you know, yeah, I'm doing that stuff when they're really not. No. And so that could be the, that could be part of it, too, is that your kids are, you know, coming from other sports, maybe. And and they've been used to that stimulus a little bit, whereas maybe ours aren't. But I, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I've seen a lot of kids. Even this year, we had a kid walk in the first day just in the warm up, strain a hamstring. Just warm -up. <laughs> right. And then that that tells me right there, I can't go out and do fly tens with this no. group. I had a kid just just strain a hamstring in the warm up. Yeah, you're making me think, you know, like our day one happened, you know, like three weeks ago, uh, like the week before Thanksgiving. And yes, half of my guys were, you know, 10 days out of football. So, yes, they do have that. Uh, behind them they probably were not lifting like crazy between yeah. football and, but the other half may not have done a damn thing but not doing a damn thing is probably better than over lifting for eight straight weeks and getting big and and stiff um so so maybe those guys i always say that uh high outputs are the reason uh, that's how you get in, injured is you don't get injured jogging typically. So, um, so guys that are not giving high outputs because they haven't been an athlete for the last three months, they're probably not even fast enough to get hurt. So, yeah. so I, I, I think there's, I have no problem with ramping up. The problem I have is that my days are so numbered and my kids are so far away from their ceiling. You know, yeah. that, that I, I just can't wait. You know, I can't do, you know, like burpees for six weeks. Yeah. You know, we have got to start sprinting. And especially for my young kids and my kids that are running 18 miles an hour. God, we just don't have time to wait. And I think a lot of track coaches, they just run laps and they don't get any faster. Right. Yeah. So for us, our ramp up, like I talked about in the, uh, in the presentation is we want max intense sprinting. We just want to slow it down is all we're going to do. So we apply chains or we do hill sprints or whatever the case is. We've done that for the last two or three years, I believe. Uh, but we also use buildups to a huge degree. I am a huge buildup guy where every step just builds on itself. It's faster, it's faster, it's faster out to a designated distance. And that distance dictates our intensity. And I, and I use buildups, honestly, as our ramp into max V over the course of generally two or three weeks. It kind of depends on the team I, I have, how, uh, you know, how our readiness is when the, when the kids come in, how they're responding to the first couple of weeks of classes, because that's another problem too. And that could be us in our situation. The first day of the workout is also the first day of, of college class for a lot of these kids. <laughs> and so you can't yeah. tell me the stress isn't through the roof because oh. our workouts, just because of how our teams are, are structured here at TCU for baseball happen at seven in the morning. So our guys are sprinting between seven and 8 a.m. And then they've got classes at 9 a.m. So they could be freaking out in their mind because I'm stressed out. I got to figure out where I'm going to class. So that, that factors in as well. Um, so all of those things kind of go into to how we have to handle that two or three week ramp up. I think Cal Dietz um, uh, at, at TFC said that he has stopped doing training during finals week because yeah. He said the stress um, uh, will lead to injuries and to just lowering outputs where maybe working out doesn't even help you all that much. Yeah. It, to be honest, uh, we're kind of the same way. Um, 
we limit it as much as possible, not only in the off season right now, which we can't, we're not technically by the NCAA rules, we can't work out during finals. So it's all optional for those kids if they want to come in. But if they do come in, it's very, very, very uh, scaled back. And it's just, just to get them moving around, honestly, to get them out of their, their room, get them moving around, break a little bit of a sweat. Um, once we get in season, though, we do have finals towards the end of our season. It's right before uh, the conference tournament starts. It's the same thing there. It is super scaled back. It's in and out of the weight room in, you know, 20, 20, 25 minutes. Our practices are very scaled back because, you know, Brian Mann did research at the University of Missouri, which it was a great study. They looked at um, injuries during, they compared injuries during finals weeks, during midterm exams, finals weeks, whatever you want to call it, and preseason. Uh, football camp and then just a normal week and during exam weeks the injury rate was almost just as high as what you saw in preseason camp football camp because this because it's stressed stress is stress yes um one of the things that um uh i find interesting is that yeah, Stu McMillan and, and i have gone back and forth and kind of a um an awkward back and forth about the submaximal issue but yet i heard him on a podcast say by definition 99 percent is submaximal and i'm like throwing up my hands and say Stu, why, why are we having why are we, why are we having this fucking fight about maximal submaximal when when i argue that that in practice none of my sprinters are hitting race speeds they right. their intent is race speed Right. But, but I know that Marcellus Moore hit 25 plus in, in, in races, but he only hit 24, two as his top speed in a yeah. practice. Yeah. So you do all this submaximal speed work. That's right. So, so, you know, I mean, it's apples to apples and, and furthermore, it's very interesting when you were talking about submaximal value, um, the, the things that you were doing, I mean, I'm going to. I mean, I'm, I'm going to do some of this stuff on Tuesday in our X Factor days that when, when you're talking about the dribble series, yeah. when you're talking about PVC in front, you know, we do all those stuff over wickets where, I mean, we threw something in the other day, one arm fist in the air. I saw and, that. And just, just forcing the brain to like, what the F, I mean, we need to like really, you know, like pay attention to, you know, front side, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but those guys aren't going 24 miles an hour. I mean, now I do think, or don't you think I'm asking a question now that a lot of your sub max stuff could be argued is still max intent. Yes. So exactly. It, it, yeah, it, it is. And I agree with you right there with uh, the Stu McMillan thing. When I went out to Altus and, and visited with him, that's what they talked about was sub maximal stuff all the time. And then he came out and I saw it on that podcast that, well, if it's not race speed, it's truly submaximal. I'm like, that's not what the submaximal word, you know, that it, it's maximal intent that I've always been interested in. Yes, we do maximal intent. It's just like the extensive sprints we would call with chains in the hill. You're slowing the speed down. It's not 95% plus. It's going to be down in that, you know, really the middle, middle range, like Charlie Francis says, stay out of it's in the middle range. You're sure. looking at probably 80 or 85%, maybe up to 90, but the speed is slowed down. The intent is still full. And that's why we love doing that into our, uh, our build up into max V is because the intent is there. The speeds are not the contraction speed. The force and it's safer. Speed. It's safer, right? Safer. There you go. Exactly. Yep. And so the same thing with our uh, dribble series, the dribble series is more of a drill, right? But we can blend that into the, to the skill. The drill blends into the skill of sprinting. Again, that's going to be sub maximal for the most part, because our guys are, are thinking about something, a, a different process going on in the brain. So you're not going to run full speed on the PVC stuff, the med ball series. Those are max intense sprints, but because of the constraint of the drill, you're not going at 95% plus we've timed those things. You're not at 95%. Yep. And there's no, nothing wrong with timing those things either to actually no. improve their intent. I, I love doing that stuff. Yeah. No, that, that's fantastic. I, I really like that. And I, I love when we can find that Venn diagram of, of, hey, we don't, like somebody could watch your presentation and say, ah, oh, see, Holler, you're all wrong because 
this guy is the smartest dude in the world and he's learned from Stu McMillan and he's a sub max guy. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I've seen Stu's guys work out and they are not lollygagging right. ever. I mean, they are totally dialed in. They are, when they do sub max sprints even, it's like, they look like they're sprinting. Right. Well, you even said, I love this, that you want the first sprint to be at 95% and the second one to be, 100 percent and oftentimes their 95 is yeah. faster than their 100 and that teaches them something yes we do that every time we do a fly we start at 95 percent after our warm-up runs after everything we've done the first fly is at 95 percent everything after that and i always say what i want you to do is i want you a half step under max speed all right just be a half step under nice and relaxed the second one i said you can let it rip and then when we come back well you know we were calling out numbers the whole time I stop them before we start that third rep every time. And I say, listen, if your 95 was faster than your 100, that tells you you need to stay relaxed and not push for more speed and not try harder. It's all about just letting the line come to you and letting that energy just, just kind of flow. And so uh, it, it's, it's telling that half of our team will be faster at 95% on the first sprint than they will the rest of the day. So keep a half step in the tank because that fluid, it, it just allows a more fluid action a faster action you're not trying you don't tighten up i think that when you time sprints fresh frequent what was the third word and fast, fast. Yeah. okay the three f's i love that um when you do that there it's be, it becomes a voyage of discovery as well like you just talked about one thing a kid can learn that his relaxation allows him to move faster some of my kids um run slow uh, a little bit faster a little bit faster and ask to do a fourth i go i've never said no and they'll run faster again they'll say can i do a fifth i've never said no and they'll do a fifth and they'll run their fastest time and that's a discovery too yeah. to me that is a body that truly requires more preparation to sprint that Many track athletes get out on the turf with their fly, with their jogging shoes on and go through a couple of speed drills and then run their sprint on the track. They're not they're not ready to sprint. They're not. No. You have. To, that's why. I mean, all my best guys are doing four by one exchanges before the meet, spiked up, hundred percent speed, one perfect handoff, and it doesn't take much. And I love the word you said that stimulus, that max speed stimulus. And I, that's kind of like different for coaches that, that have always just worked hard. A stimulus is a tiny little switch of the light switch. Yeah. And Dan Paff, uh, uh, in his presentation for TFC, said, we want to sting, not destroy. You know, that's a, you know, don't burn, don't burn the steak stuff. But yeah. I love the word sting. You know, like, we just want to sting max speed. Everybody thinks I'm Mr. Max Speed and we're always at max speed we're at max speed, maybe 12 seconds a week. That's it. You know, like, you know, 10 meter fly, you're not at max speed, eight seconds. You're, you're at that 23 miles an hour, if you're lucky for a second and a half, maybe. Right. Yeah. So, so for us, we, especially uh, to give you an idea of the college setup for us, there's a seven week window that we have fall ball, right? Fall practices. And you've only got, you know, a semester, 16 weeks, You've got two weeks on the end, finals and uh, a study week that you're really not allowed to train as a team. You've got a Thanksgiving in there. So that's three weeks already chopped off. So now out of that 13 week window, seven of it is we're playing, you know, baseball, we're practicing. So it's a massive time window that I don't necessarily have to develop guys with a bunch of volume training and anything that, you know, typical coaches would do. So that's where that stimulus comes in. I do not take away max velocity. We do fly sprints. In our season, we just do a couple reps. It's just touch a couple reps, usually two. If you feel good and you want to run a third, have at it. But during the week, we do it every week, two to three reps. So that way, when we get out of fall ball in that seven-week window, and I've got three weeks on the end before the semester's over, I don't lose out on three weeks of training because we haven't done this for seven weeks. So I got to ramp into it. We have to keep that stimulus in there. It's vertical integration, really. You keep the stimulus in there at all times, so that it can be trained at any time thereafter. And that's 100% our philosophy. And go ahead. 
do you um do you i mean you record your times and everything right absolutely every week you, you don't you don't just yell them out believe it or not there, there are coaches that time kids and that don't even yell out their times you know it's like what yeah. i mean you should not only yell them out you should have a megaphone because I mean, how did the kids not get mad at that right i mean it is uh the food of cats and and if you're not a competitor you shouldn't be an athlete when you hear somebody that just ran a good time that should affect you yeah. it should be like damn you know like i can't believe you ran that fast and 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 so all that just kind of goes into it so by recording your stuff and this is interesting because i you know, I think a lot of people think that those, I always picture baseball players as being like thick, hairy legged, you know, like 5'11", you know, yeah. not very fast. Um, and, and they, they probably see speed as immutable, you know, like you can't really change speed. Do you see speed gains? Absolutely. Absolutely. We wouldn't do it if we didn't see speed gains. Um, and we keep track of, of uh, you know, the average every year. We have standard deviations as far as what are our elite times or good times or average, below average. Um, and I think this year I'd have to go back and look because it's been a couple of weeks since I looked at our total time. I think we are, our average this year is a 1.0 seconds the year previous, which you can't compare. You lose guys, you yeah. add guys. Um, but we track numbers over the course of their entire career. Our, our guys are getting faster, yes. This year, we actually had our first 9-1 in the program in a fly 10. Uh, it's a 30-yard ramp or 30-yard buildup into a fly. We had a 9-1, a 9-2, and um, a 9-3, multiple 9-4s. Yeah, that's approaching 23 miles an hour. Yeah, the, the 9-1 is the fastest we've ever had. In years past, it's usually, I think, the fastest we've had the previous two years with 9-3. And that's also, I always try to bring this up because... Yeah, it is apples to oranges many times. Like you are, you're on a, you're on turf, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an extremely soft surface. Turf, yeah, and, field turf and tennis shoes. I mean, I just, I just had a kid the other day uh, ran 0.87. Wow. But, but this is important. We are running on an indoor track that is basically like a one millimeter rubberized coat on concrete. Yeah. So it's extremely hard. And sprint spikes, as you know, being a former track guy, have no padding. Yeah. So that all the force that goes into that hard surface comes right back into your leg, bouncing it about back up in the air. Yeah. Whereas if you if you have padded shoes, you don't get the bounce. And if you're running on, basically, I mean, most turf fields are like a, a wrestling mat. I mean, yeah. you are not getting the return. So that nine one for you would very likely be a 0.87 to me. And, and then you throw in like outdoor training where you have a 20 mile an hour wind or something. Yeah. So, so your numbers are your numbers and mine are mine. And those internal numbers are really important, but they're not really transferable to other schools. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I, I'll say this for the coaches that are on this thing. The reason that we went to timing sprints, um, <clears throat> I should have put this in my presentation. I don't know what it was, four or five years ago. Um, because before I knew about free lap, honestly, gates were very impractical for us. We yes. didn't, our budget just didn't allow for it. I hated gates because I don't know where the hell the damn laser is. I can't tell. I got a, I'm a precise guy. I want to know exactly where this thing is so that I can make sure that we are able to repeat that to time guys, because if it's off two inches, then that's, that's not apples to apples when we're timing. And I, I think you're hurting yourself if you want the truth. So I hated lasers before, but our head coach, who I'm great friends with, um, our head coach at the time said, why the hell does every guy that comes in our program from JUCO get slower? This guy was a such and such runner in JUCO, you know, home to first. <laughs> and, you know, they just make these random assumptions. And I was like, you had timing out, you, you had a gun on him, you had aids to prove that he was this fast or whatever. And he's like, oh, I can tell from looking at him. Every one of our JUCO kids gets slower and it pissed me off something fierce. And so that's when I bought free lap and I started timing every single damn sprint. So we had a guy the next year come in. He's a Juco kid. And what do they say? They're like, oh, you're going to love this kid. He's fast. He's super, super, super explosive, super fast. We timed him the first day on the, I can't remember what it was, out of 20 some position players, 27 position players, he finished 19th. <laughs> and 
immediately, guess how, I mean, guess, guess how excited I am to, to send this data over to him and say, you know, the guy that you think is really, really fast, here's where he finished today amongst our entire team. And it's not very impressive. And then they say, you know, wow, we had no idea. So maybe he plays really fast because he reads the game well or whatever the case is. But had I not been able to prove that this kid is really not that fast, they would have continued to believe that I was actually uh, hurting our athletes' performance versus helping it. And now I have objective, objective data, and I tell every coach, if you have objective data, they can never come back and say, you know, this isn't going right, or this guy looks out of shape, or this guy's not very strong, or whatever the case is, because you can prove it now. Yeah, uh, my good friend Joey Carasio, who is also a speaker at TFC, um, he is probably as, you know, the closest to thing to a feed the cats approach of any college S and C coach that I know, and their coaching staff's very traditional. And I was like, like, how did you get such a buy-in? And he said the same thing you did he said, coach, they can't argue with the numbers. Right. And I was like, there you go. So if, if you're not, if you're not, of course you have to measure what matters. I mean, university of Illinois football strength coach measured uh i mean he really cared about the bench press I, I i don't think that matters he really cared about how many guys were cleaning 315 or more um good for you but uh when your speed training is i mean he posted on twitter going through speed ladders if that's right. your speed training while you you're bragging about the other things you're not measuring what matters so that's that's awesome to hear I love that. Yeah. So the other thing I was going to touch on too, real quick, Tony, Tony, I know you're uh, looking at questions probably was the great thing about that you touched on earlier was 95%, hundred percent in our sport. It works perfect because baseball is a velocity dominant sport. Think about pitching. It's the same thing as a fly sprint. Everybody's trying to throw harder. Right. And so it, it really ties back into their brain in that a lot of guys try to throw harder and they can't because they muscle up, they create tension, energy doesn't flow efficiently. It's the same thing when we're out sprinting. So it relates back to our pitchers very, very well because it's the same effect on the mound. They know when I, when I try to throw harder, I don't. So the same thing happens. And I'll say that when I'm talking to them, when you try to throw harder, you, you, a lot of times you don't. It's when you take it off the ball that you actually increase velocity. The same thing goes with our speed work. Take a half step off, energy flows better, we're more elastic, more relaxed, and you run a faster time. So it relates back to our sport very, very well. And I was just thinking about other analogies with pitching. And correct me if I'm wrong or don't, don't act like I'm right if I'm not. But, but pitchers probably don't improve their velocity by throwing 10,000 pitches at 50 miles an hour. Exactly. Um, they, they probably improve their velocity with low dose high intent and maximal recovery is that yeah that's that's honestly what what we would use if we were doing that <laughs> yeah right the, the principles apply to everything it doesn't take a genius wow but yet sec schools are still posting uh last year <laughs> I, I i made fun of i can't remember if it was old miss or somebody um doing uh stadium stairs it, it took 60 minutes to get through it and, you know, I, I said it's bullshit or something like that, you know, and, and man, every, everybody in the, in the baseball world were like, yeah, but blah, 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 you know, like, you know, we're building a team. This yeah. is something we do. This is, this is the rebel challenger, you know, all that yeah, kind of stuff. Toughness, yeah. So, so, so what, what percentage of uh, baseball programs get it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough answer. I know it in my head, but I'm not sure I want to say it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll be honest. Many years ago, uh, I used to get caught up in some of the Omaha Challenge stuff. Our coaching staff loved it. Well, that's, yeah, it's the Omaha Challenge. So we did that stuff. Yeah, that's what they call it. I'm sure that's what they call it. Um, and so when I first got to TCU for, for many years, we did – we had that stuff set up. But as, you know, <laughs> I always knew it was wrong, but our staff loved it. They wanted it done. And as it got deeper and deeper into my years here, we started transitioning it to more games where we would draft teams and then we would play games and we would play spike ball and, and uh, med ball, volleyball. Um, 
and you know ultimate frisbee that type of stuff because i i started seeing like this is completely unnecessary for our guys <laughs> and it's just torture they're not trained for this at all and it really has no effect i mean i always knew that but i didn't know how to present that to the coaching staff and so yes in the last five years six years whatever it's been we've we've done away with with that ourselves, and um I, I laugh at myself for ever essentially allowing that to happen i i think uh, it's important to be able to laugh at yourself uh i was uh i was 40 when i started feeding the cats and i had to admit that the sport of track sucks and that, that's not easy for a track coach has won a couple state titles that yeah. my sport sucks the way i coach it sucks and um and if you're not a little bit embarrassed about your former self then you haven't grown much right exactly and, and you know i'm so upset that when i was coming up running track um i, I was actually a, a really fast athlete and all we did was this long distance just i would throw up after track workouts Me too. never did we do anything for speed never anything for power and i'm so upset because that's just the training that I was brought up doing. And I always look back and wonder how much faster could I have been? How much better could I have been? You know, and I so was never was timed time. at anything less than a repeat 200, never timed in practice in a 40, a 60, let alone a 10 meter fly. I mean, I did everything I was supposed to do, you know, because guys, future coaches are buy-in guys. Uh, they're not the people who say, I hate this shit. Um, but, oh my God, I, I was just such a half-baked sprinter. Um, but yet my coach could say, God, I got you down to 50.2 as a high school senior in the 400. <laughs> That's pretty good. And I'm like, I should have been 48.2. Yeah. So yeah. it's hard. It's hard. It stabs, to, it stabs you in the heart, doesn't it? It does. It does. You only get one chance. Because I hated track practice. I loved running track. And I hated track practice, football practice. The only thing I honestly enjoyed was, was basketball. I loved basketball practice because our coach was an older guy and he didn't kill us. If you want the truth, that's probably why. And would you agree? Uh, I mean, we're talking, yeah, we're, 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 we're two uh, kindred souls here. Uh, would you agree that uh, players that like practice will be better players? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it, we don't even have to answer that question, right? Yeah, it's, just shake your head. You know, it's, it's a no-brainer. Like... And so here's what's very interesting. We just hired a new football staff here, um, a new head football coach at TCU, and one of their principals that I've heard about, and he was on our staff previously, they essentially have two-hour practices, and he shuts it off at two hours, whether we have more to do or not. It's a two-hour practice to keep our kids fresh. We're going to do everything that we have to get done in two hours or less. And so it's all about keeping kids healthy and fresh. And their injuries have shown that over the last several years, from, from what I'm being told. Oh, a man after my own heart. Of course, yeah. I, I, did, I did know Jerry Kill pretty well. And, and, and uh, it's pretty cool that he got a chance to, to take over for a couple of games. Hey, I'm going to open up uh, the chat box here. If there's any questions... I still have another question for you and while people have an opportunity here to ask a few um, we're uh, in our last 14 minutes of this. Um, I really loved your, your, uh, your high, low practice week. I, I call it a wave theory. Um, I, I call my high practices when, when I'm consulting with football coaches. Now I talk about performance-based practices, yeah. which are the high. And fundamental based practices, which are much more teaching, you're still getting, I love what you said, you're still getting a shit ton of things done. Yeah. But, but the outputs aren't high. You, you're not, your, your, your cleats aren't laced up quite as tight. Um, you are, you are trying to get done the low output things. Um, and there's a lot of low output things in football, but then also inside the performance practice, there has to be a wave as well because you can't have a high output for two consecutive hours. Right. So you must, but uh, with that being said, uh, go ahead and talk about, I love the fact that you want to piggyback uh, or stack the high off the field and the high on the field. Yeah. I mean, really it comes back to the silo effect of 
strength coaches wanting to do with whatever the hell they want to do. We're going to trash these kids when they're in the weight room on these days, Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Friday, because that's traditionally how it's done. Or for football, it's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We're going to trash them in here because that's our lift days. And then the skill coaches over there say, well, we have practice on these days. And Tuesday, Thursday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to trash them because those are our hard, heavy days. And then they're trashed every dang day because <laughs> somebody's trashing them every single day. And if you don't consolidate the stress, it doesn't matter in what aspect. If you don't consolidate stress, then you never allow for recovery. And recovery is really the only damn thing that matters. It's not the training. It's the recovery. Because if you don't allow them to recover ever, the training does, doesn't matter then. It's all about recovery. And you have to consolidate stress on the field. Like all stressors need to be consolidated within a holistic program for ultimate athlete health and performance. If you don't consolidate those things, you're not giving them either of those. Performance goes down, health goes down because you're continually beating an athlete up. How many high days can you have a week? So we actually, you uh, commented on this tweet last year during COVID. We dropped from three to two. We now use two high days a week. And like I said last year, uh, I'll never go back. The, uh, what we saw in health and performance, just like I touched on, both of them were the best that I think we've ever had here um, by going to two high days. And so less was more for us. And a couple other things that go along with that. Uh, uh, Gabe Sanders, who did an amazing job with the sprinters at, uh, at Stanford, you know, they don't, uh, it's hard to find the fastest humans in the world that also have a 33 ACT and have taken 11 a AP courses. And, but somehow they were still like all American status in the four by one, four by four, stuff like that. And because of the stressors of Stanford, they had a four day work week. And, and once he said that, I'm like, gee, that's what we do in the winter, I guess, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, three yeah. days, super compensate over the weekend. And, and I know, so you have a four day, but what I love about your four day, see, the reason why we take Fridays off is because we have a hard time getting attendance after school on Friday. Yeah. Plus as a teacher, I like to go home too on a Friday. And so, but, but you go Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Thursday, Friday, which yes. may be the optimal four day week. Would you agree? For us, it was. And, and here's, here's what happened. Uh, we used to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I hated Monday high intensity workouts because again, I, I told you earlier, we have, we have to work out in the morning. Oh, our kids don't live right on the weekends. I was a kid that, you know, we worked out in the morning when I was in college and I overslept. I under ate, I underdid everything else. And you couldn't sleep on Sunday night. You would end up laying in bed from, you know, 11 <laughs> o'clock until two in the morning because you couldn't sleep because you did the wrong stuff on the weekend. And uh, then you'd have to get up at six. Then you were you shot your week, right? I hated doing that on Monday. So we knocked the rest off just a little bit with an activation. It's a low intensity day with some high intensity elements, but it's 30 or 40 minutes in here. Um, and then we, you know, our pitchers do some, uh, some rotator cuff scap works, things like that. But that's what it is. It's knocked the rust off Tuesday, high intensity day. And I will never, ever, ever, you know, barring schedule changes, never look back on that. I will always try to use that format from here, from here on. Uh, because I, the Monday workouts we had that were, that were high intensity, I hated watching speed work during that time. We had injuries. We had, uh, it was just always you're walking on eggshells at every step, to be honest. I hated it. So I love the fact, so you go low, high, off. I love that off on Wednesday. Yeah. And then I had to really think about why you went low on Thursday because you just had an off day. Why yeah. not go high? But then I'm thinking, wait, if you go high on Friday, you got two days off. So you really ramp up into that Friday. So the low, high, off low high and then your weekend off i just think it's really good yeah so part of the reason and part of the reason that we do that is wednesday was a day off for us in practice i wanted to make that a day off in the weight room right and that's how that off came and then i just used the same concept as we're going to knock the rust off on that thursday just a little bit because in baseball friday is always a game day so it's always a game day so we need to be prepared for high days on friday come the spring we're going to do that in the fall because we practice on those days. Um, so that's how our Friday becomes a high day for us. 
I we have, we have one question, and and we'll end it on this. This may be a seven minute answer. Um, so put your football hat on, um, and, and I mean I, I think I could answer this as well, but but your answer might be different. Uh, so during the football season, I, I assume this guy would be a high school coach. So Friday night football game, um, would you think that you only need you should only have one high day for practice during the week. So for me, Friday, I mean, it, I should say this game day is the ultimate high day, the ultimate high day, right? The highest, um, the highest, right? <laughs> so for me, you still probably look at one other high day during the week. I think you could probably structure in two possibly. Yeah. Um, but like I said, for us, it's, it's less has always been more. There's no reason that you can't schedule high intensity elements on low or moderate, what I would call moderate practice days and not kill people, right? It doesn't have to, you don't have to have the approach that, well, this is a high day, so we've really got to destroy guys on these days. If you're going to have a high day, those need to be bookended usually by lower intensity practices to allow some recovery. So yeah, it's possible that you would only have one high day. Maybe you could structure another one in there. I don't work in the uh, sport of football right now, so it's hard for me to answer. So maybe you can help a little bit more. I would say two or three. The, I, you, you know, we said that the game night's the highest. I, I always say let the game be the hardest thing you do. You don't have to do 1.5 game on your high day during the week. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, the high day, a lot of people think a high day is a crush them day. In my opinion, it's a high recovery day. Yeah, it needs Where, to be short and fast. Short and fast. Uh, Matt Campbell at Iowa State talked about their movement away from the grind. And instead of doing 20 consecutive offensive plays, they do five high-intensity plays. And then the, the B group comes out, and the A group goes out and gets coached up for five minutes. Yeah. And then they come back. So uh, the Andy Reid with the Chiefs, uh, their conditioning – is 10 high-speed plays followed by maximum recovery. Yeah. Now, that is such specific high-output stuff that football coaches do. So, yeah, I would say that um, um, you could easily survive with the game night and a high Tuesday. You could probably do two high practices uh, if you really saw them as high recovery days as right. well and yeah. uh go ahead i mean to me to me what what i think the really smart schools have gone to in college at least saturday's your game day friday is a fast and short day where it's no longer considered you know friday for us was always a walkthrough and, and it yes. was kind of a garbage day right now they put teams out there and they they sprint really really fast but it's a short practice that it's not necessarily a high day it could be a low intensity day but you have high intensity elements, right? So yep. you can structure those things throughout the week and still say, hey, we're moving really fast multiple times per week. We're just not taking these guys over the edge as far as volume is concerned. I mean, it's an in-season principle for me, intensity over volume at all times. Yep. High does not mean high volume. Yes. And, and so I that's think... the thing. People get carried away with, well, high means that this thing has to be a long, heavy, hard, you know, plus high intensity day. Those things don't have, to, they're not synonymous with each other. We can yeah. move really, really fast and get a ton of rest and have a short practice. I call them game speed plus, where, yeah. where like a receiver is actually running a route at a faster miles per hour than he would in a game because he's getting even more recovery. The outputs are so high. And a funny story, uh, I was talking to a, a coach one time, and he said, describe what low days are like. So I described to him, he goes, shit, that's what pretty much all of our days are. <laughs> in other words they were low output yeah they were hard but they were low output that the people were were not ever getting up to game speeds and and it's just a new way to think about things that kind of makes sense yeah that so you, those monday but, thursdays that you just touched on for us that are low intensity days we do our dribble series on those days we do bounds on those days we do some short short uh short distance sprints on those days we still have high intensity elements people would be shocked if they yep. came in, because we're not necessarily foam rolling and doing breathing exercises. I mean, that's still part of it sometimes, but that's not what our workout is. We do high intensity elements. It's just very, very brief. Get them in and get them out. 
Those are your low days are my X factor days. And people wonder, smart people wonder, now, wait, if you're like doing some plyos and things, that's like high C, but the dosage is so small. People don't understand how small our dosage is. Exactly. You're exactly right. We're on the same wavelength. Man, we could talk all day. Yeah. Zach, we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I really do appreciate it because I've been a big fan of yours for a long, long time. And so cleared up some stuff that uh, I wanted to chat with you about and hopefully we get to do it again. Hey, can't wait, man. Thanks to everybody that showed up and recordings will be out probably sometime later today. Thanks, Tony. See y'all.